Good evening. This time, if you would, please silence your cell phones and be advised that these proceedings are being recorded. For those of you that are physically present in the council chamber who desire to address the city council during the meeting, I see two of you that are on the agenda, though, so you won't have to listen to this part of it. Uh, anyone that, that wants to address the council during the meeting will complete a request to speak for them, and they're available at the front entrance, and you will present it to the city clerk. Speakers physically present and those participating via Zoom will be called upon at the appropriate time, and each person is allowed three minutes speaking time. So at this time, I will call to order the city council meeting for the city of Grand Terrace for March 8th, 2022. And I will be asking council member Doug Wilson to offer an invocation tonight and immediately following that will be Mayor Pro Tem who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please stand for invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Council Member Wilson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Hussey. May we have roll call, Madam City Clerk? Council Member Wilson. I'm here. Council Member Robles. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Hussey. Here. Mayor McNabo. Present. Council Member Allen is absent. Madam Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Do we have any reordering of additions to or removal of items from the agenda? No additions or deletions. Okay, thank you. We do have special presentations tonight. We have two of them. And so for our first, we have T. Milford Harrison, Division Four Director of the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. Mr. Harrison, very Thank happy you. to have you here tonight. Thank you, Your Honor, members of the council, and Conrad, <laughs> and Deborah. Thank you for uh, helping me with uh, arranging for, today, for tonight, Deborah. I appreciate it. It's okay if I call you Deborah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, I am uh, here as your representative on the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. Um, my district, Division Four, it's actually they're called a division, not a district, but it includes uh, the city of Grand Terrace, the city of Loma Linda, and the city of Redlands. And I switch Grand Terrace and Loma Linda to make sure to put them in the right order of importance. <laughs> yes. And uh, in addition to that, I have the pleasure of dealing with Riverside Highland Water Company, who you may be familiar with. We have a good relationship with Riverside Highland, and matter of fact, we put a deal together that, uh, that was consummated in December that was good for them and good for us as we continue with our goal of providing water for our children and our grandchildren. That really is the responsibility of San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District as the umbrella water agency over this entire valley. 13 retail water providers are under us and we are responsible to each one of them to make sure that there's sufficient water for them to serve their customers for years to come. Right now, we have about four million acre feet of water in the, uh, the San Bernardino Basin or the Bunker Hill Basin, whichever you prefer to call it. And that's about as much as Shasta Dam holds when it's full. 
we figure right now that our estimates are that we have enough water for the next 30 years. So we need to be cautious. We need to be conser conserving water, but we feel that there is no, no cause for alarm. I wanted to come and, and meet with you tonight and just get acquainted. Um, turns out I know half the council that's here tonight anyway. Uh, council reminded me that she was a customer of my wife and my little deli in Loma Linda that we had in 1987. That was when I was 12, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, it was nice to, to make that acquaintance again. I have just three matters that I want to bring up to you very quickly. First of all, I want to tell you how upset I am with all, all the council members for in the city of Grand Terrace. I also want to tell you how, how much impressed I am with your wisdom in stealing our deputy city manager <laughs> from my town. <laughs> this is a man that I have enjoyed to work, work with and as a, friend, as a friend for a long time, and you couldn't have done better, and I congratulate you. Number two comes from my daughter. My daughter is handicapped and has a very hard time getting out of her vehicle. She's confined to a scooter. So she's going in and out of stores and so forth. And she asked me if I would plead with you to turn Mr. TV Video into a drive through Starbucks. <laughs> just, just a little hint there, city manager. And then uh, last but not least, on April 27, we are having an Upper Santa Ana River uh, luncheon, and you are all going to be invited to that. This is just a little pre-notice, but you're going to get a formal invitation, and we're going to invite your city to make a presentation about Grand Terrace at that meeting. This is our new function that is replacing the Advisory Council. And so we want each of the cities involved to have an opportunity to make a presentation about what's happening in your city, and we'll also have some other um, pro other uh, agenda items that we'll cover uh, area things that are happening in the valley and things that we're doing as as a water district. Uh, the meeting on the 27th will be a lunch meeting, and it will be held in the beautiful dining hall of Esri, ESRI in Redlands. So um, you're all invited, and, and we would be more than happy to have you join us. And I think, Mayor, you already told me you were going to be out of town that day, but uh, uh, maybe your schedule will change, but uh, you'll send an appropriate representative, I'm sure. And that's all I had. Do you have any questions for me? I'd be happy to answer, and uh, thank you for the time. I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. And, and you don't have to go into great detail. What? You don't have to go into great detail, but you said that we have as much water as in Shasta Dam. Yes. And yet we don't have a dam of that size around here. Where would that water be? That is all underground. Right. It's in our Bunker Hill Basin. We're, we have extensive facilities along with San Bernardino Valley Water Conservation District, who has 70 percolation ponds where the water that comes out of the mountains and the water that we bring down from the state water project are put back, are put into the ground. And um, just this last week, on Thursday, on Wednesday, we had a groundbreaking for a whole new set of basins along Green Spot Road in Highland, where the water that's coming from the new Sterling sewage treatment plant that East Valley Water District is building, a $200 million facility, and from the San Bernardino, um, their new uh, water, what do they call it, water factory, clean water factory. Uh, the water from both of those will be trucked, will be uh, piped all the way past the airport and uh, to these new basins and will be put in the ground there to continue to replenish our underground basin. And the great thing about those two is that that's not a new source of water. That's not us taking water 
like they tell us up in Northern California, stealing their water, which is a joke because 70% of their water goes under the Golden Gate Bridge. But um, that'll, be, that'll be new sources of water for us that will, will be con self-contained and uh, recycling water for forever, up to, up to 13, um, 13 million gallons a day. Wow. So it's, uh, it really is, it's a $100 million facility to put that all together, but that's where your tax dollars that, that are on your tax bill, that's where the projects are as we continue to make sure that there's water for your children and your grandchildren. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I don't want to take too much time because the guy after me is much is much more interesting than I am. I want to make sure that there are, uh, there may be other questions. I want to make sure uh, give a council opportunity to ask any questions of Mr. Harrison. He covered it all. Very very good. Thank you so much for being Thank here you. tonight. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege. Thanks, Conrad. And our next special presentation is by. Mark Gibbs, he is the Director of Aviation for the San Bernardino International Airport. Mr. Gibbs, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor McNabo and City Council, community leaders, it's great to be here. Very much appreciate the, uh, the invite to be here tonight. Uh, you know, the, it's no surprise to anyone, there is an airport in your community. It's called the San Bernardino International Airport, the former Norton Air Force Base, for those that aren't familiar with it. Uh, and it's a great regional asset. I'm excited today to uh, give you an update as to what's happening at your local airport. Uh, so the, before we get into the presentation, I've got a presentation to walk you through what's happening tonight so you can visually see it and start to understand the airspace that uh, aircraft that are flying in and out of San Bernardino as well as other airports in the region uh, so you can visually see what's happening at the airport and what's happening in, over the uh, airspace above your heads. Um, but before I do that, I think it's important to take a step back and, and recognize uh, how the airport was formed and who owns it. Uh, so it is a joint powers authority. It's owned by the cities of Loma Linda, uh, the city of San Bernardino, city of Colton, city of Highland, and the county of San Bernardino. So there's an elected member uh, provided from each of those jurisdictions and that creates the Joint Powers Authority that is the San Bernardino International Airport Authority. So tonight, um, hopefully this doesn't take too long. If I get a lo little long in the tooth, Mayor, please let me know. Uh, but a few activities I wanted to discuss. One, one is the former Norton Air Force Base, what's happening today, the Good Neighbor Program, and our air services market. Former Norton Air Force Base. So in 1994, the Air Force Base closed, and with it came a lot of economic hardship that included the loss of over 10,000 jobs. But along with it, uh, walked away local investment, the tax base. It was essentially a local depression. For those of, the, of you that were part of it or were here in the community at that time, uh, it was a, a very difficult time for the entire Inland Empire. I'm a Riverside guy, grew up in Riverside. Um, I've been to Grand Terrace Church for a long time, used to play drums actually for the church in the 80s when it was uh, a new thing, but uh, very familiar with the community. I'm part of the community just like many of you. So this is what the jobs numbers look like today. So as the part of the mission of the Air Force Base, uh, when it, when it what was born out of the Air Force Base were two entities. One was the Airport Authority and the other was a local reuse um, agency called the Inland Valley Development Agency. Ours was to bring jobs, economic activity back to the Air Force, uh, excuse me, back to the Air Force Base, the, the aviation portion of it. The other one was to bring back jobs that were lost in the area around it that was owned by the Air Force Base. And that's what the IVDA did. Its job was to create economic activity with the express intent of bringing jobs back. And you can see we've hit some milestones in recent years. And 2016 was the first year we finally brought back more jobs than were lost. Uh, but we haven't stopped there. 
So as the roads were, you know, reinvigor roads were redefined, um, we partnered with a, a group to bring back development that brought back economic activity and jobs so we could build a financial base around the airport that could then be a launching pad. And as you can see, those jobs numbers have continued to increase. We're ex we don't have the 2021 numbers, but you can see by 2020, uh, we'd increased to over 14,000 jobs created uh, through the airport and through the IVDA. Uh, I think you're gonna see a nice jump again in 2021 with the addition of some of our new partners at the airport. So major employers, no surprise, Amazon has been uh, a very large um, jobs creator. In fact, their first uh, facility, uh, their first warehouse facility uh, happened on the IVDA property at the former golf course. And uh, since that time, they've continued to add jobs and economic benefit to our collective region. As the airport guy, I'm super excited to see that the airport has made its way up to number three as of last year. I think this year you'll find that the airport will be in the number two position. Uh, but those, these are the major employers that have taken place and added to uh, the growth around the airport. A lot of Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and even Fortune 50 companies are now located around the airport. So what's happening at the airport today? This is a lovely shot of our domestic terminal. Air cargo has been one of our growth markets uh, in recent years, and I'm sure folks in the community have uh, either seen the news or uh, experienced, uh, see, seen more heavy aircraft flying in and out of the airport. UPS was the first air cargo operator to join the airport. That happened really in 2017, but by 2018, they had a permanent agreement with the airport to operate and have been growing strongly ever since. Uh, that later that same year, Fred Smith came in and said, I want what UPS has, and uh, I'm not one to say no to Fred. He's kind of an industry legend that recreated air cargo in the industry. Uh, but what we've seen with these two carriers, particularly UPS, is a lot of growth in recent years. So as late as this last December, they're operating up to 12 aircraft a day, bringing in 400 new jobs uh, to the airport that didn't exist before. And with, this, with the growth and success of UP, both UPS and FedEx, uh, that led to uh, additional interest by Amazon. And they established uh, what is now the second largest uh, hub in the United States. Their main facility is in the middle of the country, as is for UPS and FedEx. Uh, Amazon's happens to be in Cincinnati. But we're the second largest in the country after that. It's a significant investment by them in your local community. Uh, we were pretty excited about that because that took them about 13 months to construct a 100-acre site. Uh, but they did it with, um, well, water in mind, right? This is an investment. This is kind of speaks. I, I included the slide because it, it speaks to the investment that they made and the commitment to your community. This is not something that had to take place, but they did it because they felt it was the right investment. Uh, so you can see this is a water infiltration system. And if you look at the size of the water recharge that's taking place underneath the apron, uh, that's a significant benefit to the Bunker Hill Basin and the water that we all rely on. There's actually two of these on the site. Uh, so this is the second one. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, this is a progress photo. And this is the ultimate uh, effect of this investment in your community. So it's a 100-acre site, 40 acres of new aircraft ramp, 658,000 square foot building. To, da to date, it's created 1,700 new jobs at the airport on its way to nearly 4,000 in the uh, years ahead. Um, commitments to st sustainability are also significant. Uh, 5.6 megawatts of solar on the roof. It's not included in that picture, but if you were to see it today, uh, you'd see a, a very large solar system on top. But in addition to that, this was the launch customer. Uh, it's the only one in the world when this launched to have all an all-electric fleet of cargo equipment, which again was another commitment to 
uh, our local community to try to invest in the future and um, and that was a significant investment on their side. Again, it was the only one like it in the world. So what else is happening? So it's important to note, uh, as our different business lines continue to grow and succeed in your region, um, you know, it's our goal to be a good neighbor to our surrounding communities. We understand that the growth taking place has impacts and that's gonna be more traffic overhead as additional economic activity takes place. And we developed the Good Neighbor Program uh, to help provide resources to people that have questions, uh, to ha that have concerns. We wanna know about those concerns. And so this program was launched about a year and a half ago, um, but it's really about, for us, you know, uh, we deal with this kind of stuff every day. We understand why airplanes fly where they do and, you know, what solutions are out there. But we like to track that stuff uh, first and foremost. And, and we're happy to have one-on-ones with any of your constituents that may have concerns with the activity that's taking place at the airport. Uh, this program is um, it's immediately available. It's on our website, sbdairport.com. You can quickly get to the site and uh, start to understand some of the resources and um, uh, that are available. So I brought one of those resources with us today uh, to the meeting, and this is one of the informational videos that provides a little more context as to why airplanes fly where they do. Hopefully I'm going to do this right with this fancy clicker in my hand. No guarantees, though. Um, is there a play button on this, Conrad? No, we gotta ask the tech guys. Guys, there should be a, something you can click on on that that'll make it play. There you go, that was it. We're not getting the visual though. There we go. Can we turn up the volume? Explanation of how the local air traffic control system surrounding SBD works. The most important responsibilities of an air traffic controller are to ensure airplanes are safely separated from each other while maintaining the most efficient flow of air traffic. Accomplishing this is complex and labor intensive. Air traffic controllers must keep aircraft properly separated as they move through the airspace system. In a busy airspace like Southern California, controllers are responsible for simultaneously directing and spacing aircraft from multiple airports, including SBD International Airport. At SBD, air traffic controllers sequence arrivals from all directions into each arrival stream for each runway end. These arrivals are merged to land on the runway sequentially. Wind direction, speed, and other operational factors determine which runway is used at any given time. In general, aircraft land and take off into the wind. When aircraft depart from SBD, an initial heading is used, then planes fan out to various departure routes. Departures and arrivals have numerous crossing routes where the departures must be separated from arrivals. Controllers continuously manage and separate arrivals and departures simultaneously throughout the day. Aircraft flying at the same altitude must remain a minimum lateral distance from each other. In the airspace surrounding airports, the minimum lateral distance is three miles. In higher altitude airspace, the minimum lateral distance is five miles. If aircraft don't meet the lateral distance separation requirements, they must remain a minimum vertical distance from each other. In normal flight altitudes for commercial aircraft, the minimum vertical distance is 1,000 feet. For arriving aircraft, a traditional descent is like walking down a flight of stairs with a step-down procedure. Based on air traffic controller instructions, the pilot descends and applies speed brakes, then levels off and powers the engines up, then descends and applies speed brakes again. The cycle repeats until the plane is on its final approach to an airport. The Ziggy and Setter are two long-standing standard terminal arrival routes that guide aircraft from multiple directions into the LA Basin, including SBD and several surrounding airports. 
Traffic volume, restricted airspace, mountainous terrain, and typical winds were factors taken into consideration in the design of the Ziggy and Setter arrival procedures. As shown in the video animation, aircraft approaching the San Bernardino area fly specific routes and are then given final directions by air traffic controllers to land at each airport in the region. The second video in this series provides more information about these procedures specific to SBD. This video provides a basic understanding of the airspace surrounding SBD and how the air traffic control system works. For more information on San Bernardino International Airport, please visit our website. Thanks for, fun. Thanks for uh, playing that, guys. Uh, so this and many other resources are available at the website in front of you, and it's really intended to inform residents or constituents that may have concerns or may just want to understand uh, a little more in depth why airplanes fly, where and how they do. Um, but we're happy to engage anyone that reaches out through the Good Neighbor program uh, so that we can log those concerns and systematically um, deal with them. So one last thing I wanted to share with the uh, group today uh, is we had a major announcement today at uh, SBD International Airport. It happened to coincide with your board meeting. Uh, but we have our first launch from the airport of commercial service that was announced today by uh, a new air carrier. It's called Breeze Airways. And it's from the founder of JetBlue Airways as well as WestJet and uh, Morris Air. Uh, so he's, he's established quite a few new air carriers in his long-standing career. Uh, but he was really excited about us because it's the first time that he's ever launched from an airport that has not had commercial air service in the past. So that's a picture of their aircraft. Tickets went on sale today, uh, and it's daily nonstop service to San Francisco International Airport. So we're pretty excited about it. You can uh, visit uh, flybreeze.com to buy your tickets. I know I bought mine today. And uh, st fares start at $49. It's a fantastic experience through SBD. We've invested in right size facilities to provide convenient and easy access because the reality is in the Inland Empire, we need more choices in air travel. And we're here to provide that. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to come back anytime should you have any questions. And in the meantime, if your constituents have any concerns, please have them visit our website at sbdairport.com. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Mr. Gibbs. You got it. Appreciate you being here and enjoy the information you shared. And video was great, but it's nice to know that you have a good neighbor program. Thank you so much. All right, so we'll move back to our agenda. We have consent calendar. Consent calendar items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the City Council at one time without discussion. Any Council member, staff member, or citizen may request removal of an item from the consent calendar for discussion. Are there requests for items to be removed from the consent calendar? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. I'd like to remove four and five okay. and discuss cool. them together. Thank you. Four and five. Are there any other removals at this time? All right. I will entertain a motion for the balance of the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Council Member Robles, second by Council Member Wilson. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Wilson? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hussey? Yes. Mayor Macnabo? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you. So, item number four that was removed reauthorize and extend remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the City of Grand Terrace, successor agency to the Grand Terrace Community Redevelopment Agency and the Ground Terrace Housing Authority for 30-day period pursuant to Ralph M. Brown Act and Assembly Bill Number 361. Mr. Bolowich. Madam Mayor, Council Members, thank you. And actually, I'd like to deal with these as, as a package deal because they're pretty well in, entwined. And um, item number five is a resolution uh, to um, terminate the local emergency regarding the coronavirus. And as uh, was ratified in um, uh, 2020. So um, for some background, we all know we've, we've gone through the pandemic. We also know that the 
Restrictions are easing. San Bernardino County two weeks ago removed, uh, rescinded their emergency order. Um, the state is relaxing uh, masking and other restriction requirements. Um, as part of this, the city of Grand Terrace did enact an emergency ordinance, which allows us to um, operate under the, the emergency conditions and gave some extraordinary power to the city manager and the council outside of the, the typical operations. As this is winding down, um, we, we're looking at it, it's probably time from an operational standpoint to stop acting like an emergency and go back to business as normal. But the, the hair on the dog is that um, by um, rescinding the emergency order, we also limit our ability or re revoke our ability to have Zoom, Zoom meetings, and we'll have to go back to in-person meetings as we did before the pandemic. So um, rather, rather than deal with these independently, I wanted to make sure that we were clear that council was aware of the implications of taking either action, and um, it's open to you for discussion, and I'm here for questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Bolowich. Are there questions for the city manager? No questions. Is there anybody w in the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Madam Mayor. All right. Okay. We'll close public comment and return the back to staff. Um, any further comments, City City Attorney? Do you have a comment on this? Uh, I don't. Uh, other than to say that if if the council desires to continue utilizing AB three sixty one, which allows for virtual meetings, my recommendation would be to. Uh, adopt the AB 361 resolution and hold off on the lifting of the uh, emergency. If the council is indifferent as to AB 361 um, and the council is comfortable lifting the emergency, then I would recommend not adopting the AB 361 and solely adopting the second resolution to lift the emergency. All right. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. And so I'll come back to council for discussion and consideration of the motion. Councilmember Wilson. Mayor, uh, I guess I'd like to ask uh, staff, how is this going to affect our availability towards funds? Because realistically, these funds are, are dedicated to the COVID situation. And if we ratify the lift, uh, are we also going to shut off the hydrant? Hmm. No, the, the funds, the, the ARP funds are already committed. So, um, and they're, they're ours to disperse as as within the guidelines as we feel necessary. So the, they were committed as part of the emergency, but for us, the emergency is now over. Kind of similar to if it were a flood or a wildfire, funding would be committed during the emergency, yet after the rain stop and the fire's out, you could still disperse those funds and use okay. them. Thank you. Right. Mayor, Mayor, if I may, one additional comment. Mr. City Attorney. Yes, thank you. Um, on the issue of virtual meetings, um, if we do not invoke AB 361, that simply means that you won't be able to uh, do a meeting virtually and not have to post your agenda at that location. Um, under the, the traditional Brown Act, you still have the opportunity to virtually participate, except you have to post your agenda at your location, allow the members of the public to participate from that location. Um, Which is how it was if somebody called in before. That's correct, yes. Okay. And, and the other part of that I was discussing with the city clerk earlier is there's also nothing prohibiting members of the public from t continuing to use uh, Zoom or virtual. They may, the public may. They're not obligated to and not required to, but we can provide it. So we can make that an option for the public. That is correct. Council members cannot par participate in that manner. That is correct. We would have to post at your location, wherever okay. you're at. All right, so it's time for discussion between council members and consideration of a motion. What shall we do? We'll take item four to begin with, which is the, well, actually, we should probably look at adopting the resolution terminating the local emergency first. Um, what would my colleagues like to do with that? Mayor, uh, I don't. I don't see or hear an, an advantage to us jumping into uh, changing our status. Uh, is this something that's been initiated from a state situation or what have other uh, jurisdictions right. done? Well, the, the county has terminated their emergency. 
And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if we're in the county and the county's no longer calling this an emergency, I'm, I'm wondering how we can, we can state affirmatively that we still have emergency conditions in our city. Well, I don't think it needs to be permanently, but obviously, you know, it's a pretty quick run. And the way the county uh, worked with some things is they actually shut down their entire uh, building and safety department, public works, and the whole shoot and match at a point made it almost impossible for businesses to, to work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I put a lot of faith in what the county does. Right. But I, I guess what I'm saying is it's hard for us to justify a local emergency. And then I'm wondering what the benefit is to continue the local emergency. Do we do are, are there any opinions about what we gain by continuing to declare a local emergency? Councilmember Robles. Yeah, I, I um, had some sentiments about not rushing into it. But again, if, if the county lifts theirs and it's based on numbers, if, if the numbers come back, we can just always go that that route of, of emergency. Or we could, yeah, we could adopt another one if, if need be. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, um, Council member, or, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Hussey. Yo, know, Mayor, we gotta move forward. Just can't just keep on being emergency after emergency when the county <clears throat> is out of it and other cities are out of it, states out of it, we just gotta move forward. And like you said, if we need to come back and bring an emergency, then we will. You know, we just, we got to put this behind us. I think, you know, the city did a, a good job working with the county and all the precautions that we can make. You know, unfortunately, towards the last of it, I got COVID, but, you know, who would have guessed? But, um, but, yeah, we need to move forward. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda item. I'll second it. Okay, so motion to... Approve item number five by Mayor Pro Tem Hussey, second by Mayor uh, Council Member Robles. Any further discussion? May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Wilson? Yes. Council Member Robles? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hussey? Yes. Mayor Maximus? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank right. you. Thank you. Okay, so now that we did that, do we even have a leg to stand on for item number four? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say no, and I would re recommend that the staff pull the item. Okay. Staff, would you like to pull that item? Staff officially pulls the item. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right, so that, that concludes our consent calendar items. Um, we have an opportunity for public comment on items not on the agenda. Do we have any requests to speak on this item? Uh, no, Madam Mayor. All right. So I'm gonna close public comment and move on to the rest of our agenda. We have no public hearing, no unfinished business. We have no new business. Wow. <laughs> we do have requests for future agenda item by city council. And it says none on my little sheet here, but I see that we have one. So um, Mayor Pro Tem, you have an item that you're bringing forward to. Um, yes, Mayor. I, I'm Doctor, I know we got an ordinance on this, but I'm just wondering if you know, I like to bring the ordinance up for modification and uh, prohibit a primary business from using food vendors at business locations as supplemental businesses. Um, I got numerous calls one Saturday about a food truck being at an area for 12 hours on a prime uh, restaurant day and being on a city council, you know, our job is to take care. We, we beg these companies to come in brick and mortar would take care of them. And the other concern was that the, the food truck belonged to a business that didn't have anything to do with food. So, um, and I know that we do have food trucks you know, on special occasions and stuff. So I just, you know, we're a body. And I, I told them, I, could, I can't make a decision. We're a body here. You know, this has got to be brought to the council. So I would like to, you know, look into this matter as the council and see what if the ordinance needs to be brought up, modified, or brought up to date. So that's my main concern. I'd just like to look into this so we don't have future food carts or food vendors or anything taken away from our businesses that we're you know, supposed to protect. I could support bringing the ordinance up for rediscussion. I, I don't know if I would, I, I, I can't support straight out saying I wanna prohibit primary businesses in the way it's written, but I can certainly support no, and a discussion I, about the, the ordinance. Yeah, and, and the prohibit's and, probably a big word, but I want to okay. look into ordinance and see what we could do if we had, you know, any, uh, I think the ordinance was put in 1990, if we have any modifications that need to be done. 
and to bring it up to you know our standards and and hear also public input on this ordinance and business owners inputs okay so that's your motion and i can second that any discussion on this item mayor there's a possibility that maybe we may want to look at uh, exempting a 501 c3 uh, from that kind of requirement considering the fact that we may have some situations where we've got uh, food trucks or whatever that might be appropriate in relation to uh, uh, little activities that we might put on that might be close to other food establishments but would be serving just that particular function. Which, which I believe I'm, I'm suggesting would be part of a discussion of the ordinance in and of itself to me is a, is a bigger Yes. It's a bigger discussion than than just yeah. It's a bigger umbrella focusing on prohibiting primary businesses. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mayor. It, yes, you. it's a bigger umbrella, and like I said, the 501C, you know, our businesses know it's coming, and we're not by you know prime locations. We well, do because I know we have a lot of you know fundraisers and that, but it's usually out of the the main thoroughfare, and our businesses are know everything's coming. They know it's not prime time, and know it's not you know prime day for them to lose their customer base. So, but yes, the, the overall umbrella. But yeah, prohibits a bad, you know, it's not bad, but you know, it's a, it oversteps, but to look into this agenda, so. Okay, so the motion is to bring back the, the ordinance for discussion and perhaps modification and have public input. And that what was, that's what was seconded. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Any request uh, well we don't generally ask for requests to speak because we're not really speaking on an item necessarily so if you would madam clerk please give us a roll call vote councilmember wilson yes councilmember rober yes mayor to pro tem hesse yes and mayor mcnabo yes motion passes unanimously all right thank you very much we will come for council communications beginning with councilmember doug wilson thank you mayor uh, as you know, we attended the Little League uh, grand opening, and, and I got an opportunity to watch the mayor uh, pitch a couple of balls, and uh, one of them was a softball, and it had wings. <laughs> and then we also, she also uh, pitched the hardball, and it got a little bit closer. Did dribble right over the plate, which I thought was, you know, entertaining at least. And then. Uh, we went from there and, and attended the Eagle Scout ceremony at the uh, uh, here at the community center for young Mr. McClelland, and I want to congratulate him again as well as his parents. We know there's a lot of work put into these things, and the basic tenets of the Boy Scouts remains intact, and I think that, that they are sound and and happy to uh, lend our facility to be able to honor. Uh, his Eagle Scout ceremony. And that's all I have. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sylvia Robles. I have nothing, thank you. All right, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Bill Hussey. I have nothing, Mayor, thank you. All right. I have a couple things. I will begin with um, Omnitrans meeting. We, they, um, they gave us an update on bus stop safety improvement implementation plan and um, also a staffing and compensation comprehensive review and updates to policy. They called for a public hearing for federal transit admission funding, which will help to pay for some of these improvements. And what they're looking at is improving mobility, visibility, and response times at the San Bernardino Transit Center also. So they have security officers that have begun using what they call T3 patrollers. They're like little Segway scooters that are electric, and it helps them to get around and be there so that those that are the traveling public realizes that, that there are security officers able to get around quickly and able to be there to make sure that they see what's going on and everything is happening as it should. So they conduct these patrols, enhance the customer service, and then the vehicles serve as a great tool for developing positive community relations because I think the passengers say, what is that you're riding? <laughs> they look pretty fun, actually. All right, so in response to the tight label mar labor market, um, we are, uh, the, the staff is using the board approved service resumption triggers. Omnitrans reduced its services in January 2022, and they are currently operating at 72% of planned service levels compared to the 78% during August and December of 2021. So that's not good news. Um, they had initially planned that they would be up to 83% in January of 2022. 
The service reduction was necessary to provide reliable service levels, avoid coach operator burnouts, and respond to COVID leaves and tight labor market. So Omnitrans is looking for those that want to operate their coaches and, um, and do some administrative and other maintenance jobs. So if anyone is really, really looking for a career, Omnitrans has a good package and we just reviewed their salary um, for all of, the, all of the areas to make sure that they are at least market, if not maybe a little bit better. So now's a good time to check out Omnitrans for their hiring, for their hiring and they are doing job fairs. They wanna get those service levels back up and so they need co coach operators to do it. And so in November, 2021, Omnitrans was awarded 79,000 by SBCTA as part of a 2021 20, Transportation Development Act um, Transit Stop Access Program. This was a competitive program that allowed Omnitrans to receive funding to improve bus stop amenities. So um, we received that update and they will be looking at lighting, signs, benches, and upgrading shelters and doing ADA improvements. Nine projects in the geographic area of Grand Terrace and, and the Colton routes are slated for part of this improvement plan. We do not have to fight with Colton. They have, they have identified um, closely geographically related bus stops for both of our cities. And so that's really good news. Um, SBCTA, the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, we discussed in-person and virtual board committee meetings and um, acting as the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority and Council of Governments has decided to go back to in-person meetings at this time. Um, we also discussed uh, regional and sub-regional planning. And what they're talking about is the, the issue of looking at the region and the, the affordable housing requirements throughout the region. And they have a framework that they're putting together for a housing trust. And I believe that they are inviting city managers to weigh in on that discussion too. It's kind of an interesting concept, but it's, it's, it's early in the planning. But uh, perhaps we could get a presentation about that to consider if it's something that we would be interested in taking part in. And so um, Little League ceremonies were fun. I, I wanna thank the parents, the coaches. They, you know, they, they do the coaching, they take care of the fields. They, um, they form a board that actually, you know, that it is the reason that we have a league and they put in a lot of work to make sure that the kids have a good time playing. And then of course they invite me out every, periodically to throw a baseball and a softball and I get to use that as a, as a teaching moment for, this, for the players to let them know that practice is important and so is warming up because it really enhances your performance. Uh, the Eagle Scout Court of Honor was, was also a privilege to be there to represent the city. We did give a nice commendation to Mr. M young Mr. McClellan. He is responsible for our flag retirement box that is here at City Hall, which is a really nice uh, resource for our residents when their flags are in disrepair and they need to do something with them. They take them to that box and then the, then the Boy Scouts will, um, they do periodic flag retirement ceremonies. And then the Blue Mountain Hike. Thank you so much to city staff for all their work. Um, Madam City Clerk and her husband came out from, from their homes up in the high desert, so that was wonderful to have you there. That was an early morning for you, I know. The organizations that came out to support, and we had a little cheer factory. Cheerleaders up at the top cheering us on when we got there. It was a wonderful day, and the weather. Oh, you planned the weather so perfectly, Mr. City Manager. Thank you so much. And so that is where I will end, and I will say, Mr. City Manager, do you have any comments for us? Well, you know, I put the weather order in special just for you, so um, hopefully everything else runs as smoothly. Can you guys start the video since the mayor brought that up? We got a short, a brief video that shows the, the hike.
I was remiss in also not thanking this chair. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Lane, and, and the support that you and your deputies gave us. And the um, search and rescue was there, right? Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. I apologize for leaving that out. That was a big part of the day. Mr. Foley. So just to, to, to finish on that, our staff was remarkable. Um, it really shows what a great group of employees we have and their commitment from just every department, from finance, actually finance showed up and took a walk up there too. So every department was represented. Um, the fire department was, was great, very, very helpful throughout. And we really could not have pulled it off without the, the search and rescue group from the sheriff's department. So th thank you to everybody. It was a real great community event. Um, we're, we had 318 release forms. There were multiple people on forms. So we're estimating there was somewhere between 400 and 450 people um, made, made the walk. Hopefully they all made it to the top. Um, but it, it was a great event. Uh, with that, and I'm sure you as a, the council is aware, but for the community, we, are, we had the meeting with the successor agency on Monday. They uh, approved our final dissolution documents. They are at the state uh, or at the county completing. They need to be filed with the separate ag agencies. And at some point in the next 30 to 45 days, we will be out of the redevelopment business. Uh, we're the first city in, in the county to do that and one of only a handful of cities in the state to finish redevelopment. Can I make a comment on that too? Be before you start the, the applause, because that's necessary. One of the members of the oversight told me that the presentation given was so good, that is why there were no questions. Well, that needs to be part of the applause too, so. Thank you, our, our finance director did a, a marvelous job all the way around. Um, as the mayor brought up, and just really briefly, this, the city managers are working on the ho housing trust discussion so we can, the cities can pool the, the our arena numbers and kind of work on a, a regional solution to a regional problem. And uh, I think we're, we're excited about that. And then the final one, the Grand Terrace Soccer um, Group have, was selected for the 2023-2024 the and 2025 uh, regional championships, so we will be hosting the regional championship tournaments here in the city um, outside of just the, you know, the nod for the quality of our fields and the quality of the play and, and the community. These things tend to bring in um, some some economic stimulus as people come and they, they stay in the area, they eat, they eat food from the restaurants and, and engage with the community. So we're very excited to be able to host that. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. All good news. And further good news, we have no closed session. So at this time, we will adjourn to the next regular city council meeting that will be held Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022 at 6 p.m. Any request to have an item placed on a future agenda must be made in writing and submitted to the city clerk's office, and the request will be processed in accordance with council, council procedures. We are adjourned. <laughs>